<clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, here we are. <laughs> As you may uh, recall, I said back in February that the way forward on the debt ceiling was for the speaker and the president to sit down and discuss the matter. It took the president months to accept the reality that in divided government, in a debt ceiling situation, is a time for negotiation. In fact, seven out of the last 10 debt ceilings have included other items. And now the drama is in the House. Uh, we anticipate the bill passing and coming over uh, to us as soon as tomorrow. We had a healthy discussion at lunch about the pros and cons. I, I would say that uh, most of my members who have objections would like to do more of the things that are already in the bill. I think uh, Speaker McCarthy should be congratulated on uh, capturing a, a number of priorities. And the best way to look at the difference Two years ago, we were in the process of spending $1.9 trillion. And then last year, another $750 billion. So we've gone from one party spending $2.7 trillion in two years to a discussion about actually reducing government spending. So I think the American people's decision to change the House has already yielded benefits uh, for our country. Well, as the leader pointed out, um, the House will act later today and send something over here that we will uh, have the opportunity to vote on in the Senate. And that is, as the leader described, uh, the process from the very beginning that we said would be necessary to get to a deal in the end. And that is to have the leadership in the House, representative, speaker of the House, uh, Kevin McCarthy and the President be able to sit down and negotiate something, which they have done. And uh, in as much as it isn't everything a lot of us would like to see, uh, there are many of us who think that the defense number is not uh, sufficient. Um, there are some, some real wins in this, I think, hopefully for the American people, uh, not the least of which is the first reduction in non-defense discretionary spending in a decade. One and a half trillion dollar reduction in non-defense discretionary spending at a time when defense spending is actually going to go up. And that, too, is something that we have, have not seen in a long time, where you actually uh, are reducing non-defense spending at the same time you're, you're increasing uh, d uh, national security uh, funding. Um, secondly, the permitting reforms, which you'll probably hear a couple of my colleagues talk about, uh, also are significant in the sense that they get rid of some of the needless delays and that have slowed down uh, a lot of these energy projects around the country that would lower energy costs for the American people. So uh, creating some deadlines there is really critical. Uh, pulling back some of the unspent COVID money, also important, and, and also some of the money that uh, the Democrats are trying to, you know, plus up for enforcement at the IRS. Some of those IRS dollars, the, you know, <laughs> tens of billions of dollars and uh, thousands, tens of thousands of additional employees, uh, some of that's going to be pulled back as well. So I think all in all, um, the House uh, leadership did their job, uh, put back, forth their best effort, and uh, produced a product that I hope will get uh, a good vote, not only in the House of Representatives, but also here in the United States Senate. The, uh, the bill negotiated by Speaker McCarthy is a first step on the road to common sense conservative governing. It is clearly an important change in direction from the reckless tax and spending that the Democrats have been engaged in in the last two years. Uh, President Biden and the Democrats really went on a major spending binge, and that ignited a flame, an inferno of inflation, 40-year high inflation that is still burning members of the people of the, and the citizens all around this country. So anyone with an ounce of common sense knows that this dangerous path must be changed. We can't continue in this direction. 
People across the country have been saying clearly any raising of the debt ceiling must be coupled to reining in dangerous high spending. 60 percent of Americans say now is the time to rein in spending, and this bill does that. So many of us wish it could have gone a lot further, specifically with cutting spending. When there's a bipartisan bill like this, there are missed opportunities in terms of getting government growth under control and putting us on a sustainable path. This is a first step. We need many more steps if we're going to be able to tackle the debt and beat back inflation. And an important thing to do is reignite American energy production. The, the reforms that we see in permitting, we need more. We need real regulatory relief for affordable American energy. If you really want to grow the economy, get people back to work, and lower prices, affordable American energy is the solution. Folks, as we're approaching our $31 trillion of debt, we need to rethink how we are spending our hardworking taxpayer dollars. One of President Biden's policies that has been enacted recently is the forgiveness of student loans. And what President Biden is doing is transferring those student loans and those student loan debt onto the backs of hardworking Iowans and, and others. And I'll give a couple of examples of this. Uh, my brother did not have the pathway into college. He chose to enter the workforce straight out of high school. He is a union laborer. He's a union laborer, and yet President Biden is asking my brother, who went straight into the workforce, to pay for the student loans, hypothetically, for some man or woman who got student loans and is now working on Wall Street in a six-figure job. It's unfair. My sister went to community college. She worked her way through school to get her associate's degree. Now she's being asked to pay for someone who chose to take out a student loan and sign on that dotted line that they would repay their student loan. Now my sister is being asked, with her two-year degree, to pay back somebody else's obligations. President Biden has to stop this. And if he won't, well, we will. This afternoon, I am really proud to be able to co-lead an effort to overturn President Biden's socialist student loan transfer program. And I hope that all of our Republicans join on this effort, and I hope that our Senate Democrats do as well. The House passed this very same measure last week in a bipartisan effort. So I hope again today that we see it pass through the United States Senate. Uh, I hope that the President will sign it into law, and it will save our hardworking taxpayers, just like my sister, just like my brother. It will save them $300 billion. Well, thank you all for being here. And as uh, Senator Barrasso said, this is a good first step. I congratulate Speaker McCarthy, having served with him for many years over in the House side. Uh, he has, a, I think, a tremendous read on his conference. And he insisted that the president get to the negotiating table with him, as our leader did as well, to negotiate a package. Remember, Senator Schumer and President Biden said, we're not going to negotiate. It's not negotiable. And those, those words felt were hollow. So a negotiated package, you don't get everything that you want. We have some common sense. We have less spending in here, the IRS issues. But the issue that uh, I am drawn to and that has great impacts not just for me on my committee work, but also in my state, is the permitting reform and the MVP pipeline. So Senator Barrasso and I have been working on this through our, our two committees. We laid out four provisions of what permitting reform could have meaningful uh, impacts. One is to have it be agnostic as to what type of project you have. If it's a renewable project, if it's a, a fossil fuel project, whatever it is, it has to be, the permitting has to be even and fair all across the board. And uh, the, the provisions, while they're not, they don't go as far enough as certainly as we would go nearly far enough, 
They, do, they are agnostic as to what type of projects you have going forward. We asked for some deadline relief, big deadline relief. I would have preferred to have uh, a, a provision where if you pass your deadline as a regulator, then it's deemed, um, it's deemed permitted. Uh, couldn't go that far, but we, do ha we did have timelines. We have one federal decision in there they were able to get in there that they are using off of their Builder Act. And the last thing is NEPA reform. We haven't had NEPA reform since 1982. Uh, and so three of our four parameters were at least touched on in this bill. So that, I think, is significant, and that will give us a good jumping point to start off again in our bipartisan talks and committee on permitting reform. Lastly, the Mountain Valley Pipeline is exceedingly important to our region, the eastern seaboard of this country. It is 95 percent complete. I have had numerous conversations, as have many from our state and other states, with everybody saying how critically important the product of natural gas that is carried through this pipeline is to the energy security of this country. And so after many, many attempts in the court to shut the entire thing down, it's time to bring it to a close. And this agreement brings it to a close. The Corps of Engineers has to offer the per has to put the permit forward in 21 days. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the permitting, it has been permitted by the Forest Service. It has been permitted by the Fish and Wildlife, the Biden and Trump Fish and Wildlife and Forest Service. This is well on its way. So we are very pleased, I am very pleased, that the MB pipeline, which I've worked hard with others and certainly in our state and everywhere else to make sure that it gets a fair hearing and it will be complete. Well, understandably, there's been a lot of talk about the debt ceiling negotiation and the, the battle going on here in Capitol Hill. But it's important not to overlook a very important Supreme Court decision that was issued last week. For far too long, the Democrats have relied on the courts and bureaucratic agencies to accomplish what they can't get done through the legislative process. Well, some of those days are now over. Last week's ruling on the waters of the U.S. is one more example of bringing some common sense back to our government to rein in much of the big government overreach we see from Washington, D.C. In the Sackett versus EPA case, the Supreme Court unanimously reaffirmed private landowner rights and cracked down on the overreach in the waters of the U.S. regulation. In Montana and in many states out west, we say that whiskey's for drinking, but water's for fighting. This WOTUS rule expanded federal regulatory power over waterways that even included dry ditches and dried up ponds. This allowed the heavy hand of the federal government to take away the land rights of Montana farmers and Montana ranchers, Montana families. The Supreme Court decision rightfully put landowners back in charge. This is a big win. It didn't get a lot of coverage, as it probably should have last week when the Senate was in session. But many of you may have enjoyed a nice lunch today. You can thank a rancher. You can thank a farmer. You can thank the fact they've got water available to make sure they can grow their crops and grow their livestock. Our, no our nation no longer has to worry with these out-of-touch bureaucrats that probably can't find Montana on a map making decisions about Montanans' lands for them. What's your expectation as to how fast the Senate should move on this? Some people think Friday night, you want to keep the markets calm. Obviously, the deadline is Monday. How long of the weekend do you think is reasonable to give people their say before this has to get done over the weekend or Friday? I can tell you what I hope happens is that those who have amendments, if given votes, will yield back time so that we can uh, finish this uh, Thursday or Friday and soothe the country and soothe the markets. Your colleague, Rand Paul, says it's unreasonable to try to make a dent in the federal deficit. If you're only looking at non-defense discretionary, you need to look at the mandatory programs, Social Security, Medicare. You've said in the past that big things happen under divided government. Do you think you'll be able to bring the Democrats or force the Democrats to the table 
on those biggest drivers, the debt, Social Security, and Medicare, any time in the foreseeable future? Well, that's a better question to uh, address, Senator Paul. It's been challenging over the years uh, to get both sides to look at the very large picture. But, as I said earlier, in this two-year period, we've gone from spending $2.7 trillion to talking about cutting $1.5 trillion over the next few years and in adopting at least versions of other Republican uh, priorities, all of which have been outlined here. So it would, at least we're going in a different direction. Mr. Leader, Mr. Leader, Mr. Leader. Mr. Leader. Mr. Leader. Mr. Leader. Is there a lot of concerns within your conference about the defense spending level that does not keep up with yeah. the pace of inflation? Do you share those concerns? <clears throat> Speaker, negotiate a better deal. Yeah, I think that's uh, the, the worst part of the deal. Um, is the defense buildup, which we began in December, uh, peters out and is only up slightly, but more than domestic. So I, I don't think it's as good as I would like, but if you look at the totality of the agreement, I think it should be supported and our defense needs will still be there. In fact, if you consider what we did in December and add to it what this bill would do, that's a 9.7 percent increase, at least heading in the right direction. Mr. Leader, 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 Mr.